All right, welcome back to another episode of Tech Tap Room. I'm your host, Jack Kessler, and today we've got a very special episode. We have Carrie Shumway of uh, Beer Business Finance and Ohanify's very own Stephen Wilborn. We're going to talk a lot about finance, production, distribution, the whole nine yards. So, Carrie, uh, you're our guest on the show today. Can you tell us who you are, what you're about, um, your background, what do you do, all that stuff? Yes, I will. Thanks for having me, guys. So, I'm Carrie Shumway. I'm a CPA. CFO, numbers guy. I love numbers. I love spreadsheets. And basically I started, you know, as a CPA doing tax returns and reviews and all that stuff and transitioned over to be a CFO for a beer distributor for about 15 years. And eventually we, you know, we ran that business, acquired other businesses, sold, uh, eventually sold everything off and then transitioned over to a CFO and partner for a brewery. So really for the last 20 plus years, you know, I've been in finance, been in the beer industry, and kind of along the way, you know, you learn things, you make mistakes, you figure things out. And so I just started writing stuff down. So I would be like, just, well, maybe I'll write this down for my own, you know, write out a process, write out a checklist. And then it became a, oh, blogging is the thing, articles, maybe I'll share this. So I just started sharing what I was learning and people were actually like, oh, this is helpful. And I'm like, really? I, you know, I thought it would be like, my mom would be interested in it. And, you know, maybe some people would feel bad for me, but people eventually were like, wow, we actually need sort of help on the finance side. So I would start, you know, creating courses and then it led to webinars and podcasts and whatnot. So basically what I do now is, you know, financial training for folks in the beer industry. And, you know, I think it's much needed, you know, for breweries, for beer wholesalers, that's really the market that I serve. That's the the people that I understand, the businesses that I understand. So basically I have um, craft brewery financial training and beer business finance these are two websites that provide, you know, essentially financial courses and information for people that that want to learn that. And it's very focused on finance for non-financial folks, because I recognize not everyone's a, a finance person or loves debits and credits as I do. So try to keep it more straightforward. Fantastic. Uh, Stephen, can you introduce yourself? Yeah. So Stephen Walborn, Vice President of Strategy here at Ohanify. Um, essentially, my background is I, I just recently came from um, Artisanal Brewing Ventures, where I was the master planner and analysis manager. So basically in charge of uh, production planning, uh, operational analytics, costing analysis, um, cost savings, you kind of name it across the board. And then we were sort of part of that. Uh, but before that, I was in the fragrance industry doing similar thing of, you know, essentially production planning, uh, international costing, um, and and all the things kind of along the um, along that side, but I really enjoyed technology. It was something I was really interested in. Um, you know, I'd been a user of these systems for a long, long time, and then you know had an opportunity to come join Ohanify. So bringing that knowledge of production, uh, things that people want to see, especially when it comes to costs and purchasing and landed and all of this stuff, was uh, um, something I wanted to help bring to the table. Awesome, yeah, great to have you both on, um, Carrie. Just softball question here for you when you've been talking to a lot of um brewery owners and beer producers what's a common blind spot that you find when it comes to them dealing with finances what's like the most common the biggest hurdle that they can, like can't seem to overcome or what's stopping them you get what i mean sure yeah i think a lot of it is just you know they didn't get into the beer business to to be accountants and you know to look at numbers it's sort of like oh okay somebody else is going to handle i have a bookkeeper or you know, my sister-in-law helps with this and that. So I think it's really just a core skill set that's missing. Like, how do I even read my numbers? How do I set them up? I think there's a lot of uncertainty about, you know, what's actually going on from a financial perspective in their business. They just don't really know. They don't have a good handle on it. And they just don't have the training. I mean, that's, it's just like anything. I can't walk into their brewery and brew, brew beer like they can. Um, so you got to have that kind of skill set. So the biggest blind set, blind spot i believe is you know just not having the uh the understanding of of how to read their financial statements so we we tend to start with the real basic level of all right let's look at what you got you start with the the bones of the financials which is their chart of accounts it's all the listing of things they're going to track and then we look at what they're running for reports now and we just sort of break it down and simplify because it's like anything it's like wow this seems really complicated until you do it 10 or 15 times. And then you're like, oh, this isn't that complicated. So for me, a lot of it is sort of helping folks get over that initial hurdle that you can do this and we're going to, we're going to walk through it together. 
you know, whether that's me working with people or they're taking the courses or reading the blog post or whatnot. So it does take a little bit of time, but that's, that's the biggest blind spot. It's just no confidence in their numbers, no understanding of what they're looking at or where they're supposed to be. You know, my, is it, am I doing good? Am I not doing good? I look at my bank account and some days I feel good and some days I feel scared. Uh, so it's a lot of that uncertainty relative to, to understanding their financial numbers. Right. Yeah. And I, I would agree with that too, because I think, you know, I think a lot of the the breweries and, and brewers really are more artists than they are, you know, financial people or operations people, you know, it's, it's a, it's an art form for them. So, you know, some of those skills that you, know, you get from being involved in like larger production, uh, understanding efficiency, you know, how important costs and purchase price variances are and stuff like that, you know, are things that are just missing. Um, which, you know, it's not a bad thing. They just probably started brewing beer in their garage and then, you know, it turned into this massive, uh, you know, massive thing that they're trying to, trying to just hold on to and, uh, keep, keep things moving. Right on. All right. Uh, this question goes out to both of you. Um, can you share insights on how understanding financial metrics can directly impact the cash flow and profitability of a beer business? Uh, uh, well, if we're going to talk cash flow, I mean, one of the first things that I think are important is they need to understand their inventory and their inventory turns. Uh, you know, how, how much inventory is being held, how fast they're going through it. Uh, if, if, you know, they're trying to really focus in on, on cash flow, because, you know, I've seen a lot of, a lot of people hold a lot of inventory for no reason. And it's just sitting there holding all this money, uh, that they need to start figuring out how to offload. Yeah, we absolutely. And we look at like <clears throat> the cash flow cycle, like, you know, how quickly that you, have, you collect money versus, you know, the speed with which you're spending it and what's the, the differential there. But a lot of times we'll set up basically cash flow scorecards and profitability scorecard. So you look at a handful of metrics, you know, certainly inventory turns a big one, accounts receivable, how, you know, we, accounts receivable days, sales outstanding, like how much money do people owe you at a given time? How much should they owe you based on the credit you're extending? And this would be for, you know, on the brewery side, those that are self-distributing or working with a wholesaler. And then, you know, for beer distributors, those that are working with hundreds or thousands of retail accounts, it can be quite, quite remarkable. And you look at accounts payable, uh, then you look at your capital expenditures, your debt. So there's there's five or six that you want to put on your cash flow um, key metrics dashboard that you can watch on a regular basis, and that's really going to help you because I think most small business owners really manage cash flow by looking at what's on the in the bank at any given time. You know, and again, that, that leads to some days you feel great because there's money, and other days you, you, what there's no money in there. What am I going to do? And there's panic. So you get this sort of cycle of but the metrics can help you with sort of forward forecasting what's going to happen. I see what's happening now. Well, what's, what are my inventory terms looking like? What should they be? And then you can benchmark against those as well. Yeah. So when it comes to like hops, like in your experience, like what have you uh, done in terms of cash flow with hops? I know that's always a, a really tough one, um, especially as you're trying to create these contracts three or four years out, no idea what you're going to sell and all the money they're having to put up front for that brutal yeah it's really hard it's tough well it really you know it starts with i mean hops are a by what do i need for hops as a byproduct of what am i going to produce which is a byproduct of what am i going to sell so you really got to start with this really advocate most people don't like budgeting but it's kind of the only way to know how to answer every question that comes next like what should i buy for well what are you going to sell well i don't know what i'm going to sell. well let's figure out what you're going to sell yeah. so you look at what do i think i'm going to sell therefore what do i need to produce and at which timing and what quantities and what brands so it's a sales forecast basically that it takes time it just does but again like anything the more you do it more frequently and then it'll help answer that question how many hops do i need when do i need them okay what's that pro what are the costs right now how do i feel about locking into this contract you know do i want to go a little heavier a little bit light what happens if i get too much what happens if i have too little it, you know, a lot of businesses is, uns is, is uncertainty, but the sales forecasting process can help kind of eliminate that and give you give you some structure to help answer answer those questions. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, the sales forecasting, like all of that is really important. Um, it's just funny because I've seen asked the same question to to like a couple of brewers and they're like, well, I don't even know what I'm doing next week, uh, let alone figuring out what I'm going to do three years from now. Uh, and you're like, OK, well, I, I don't know what else to tell you, but uh but yeah, no, it's just, I know hops are tough. And then, you know, especially with kind of the, 
uh, people leaning more towards lagers and getting away from some of the IPAs. We're seeing that kind of trend a little bit more. It's uh, there's a lot of people holding a lot of hops on hand, years worth that they're, I don't know what they're going to do with it. Yeah. There's a lot of people that you're right. There's in, in the same spot, you kind of get stuck. And yeah. So I think that's just, uh, there is, there's certain risks that are hard to eliminate, but you can mitigate them with that planning. And, and I do, I, I hear that a lot too. It's almost a badge of honor. We don't plan. We just wing it. And they're like, well, if you yeah. wing it, you're, you're kind of going to end up in a, in a tricky spot. So we do have to bring a level of sophistication to our planning. And I, you know, I, I'm biased because it's financial planning, but it really, it affects the operations of your business. So I don't, I don't think it's good enough anymore to just kind of wing it. And it was fine 10 years ago. I've been doing this forever and it was fine because you make, you're making yeah. tons of money, right? right? Everybody's buying your beer. There's not that many. The, the margin of error is just so much more thin these days. You, you, you've got to bring a level of sophistication. You just, you just have to. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was, it didn't matter what you made. It was all going to sell out, you know, and having limited releases, people around, you know, wrapping around the building, waiting to, to get one of, one of the bottles. I mean, it was, it was wild. And now it's, you know, I feel like it really has shifted a lot into, you know, being more cost conscious, cash concept conscious, and really trying to understand marketing a lot more. That's one thing I don't, I don't think uh, they do compared to like some of the other things that we see. So like, you know, THC beverages and, and some of the energy drinks, they are nothing but marketing companies, it feels like. Obviously, they're doing some production and stuff. But the reality is, is compared to you know, like breweries, it's one thing I think that they're kind of missing in, in what they're investing in, um, for sure. All right. How would you both suggest that uh, people who are interested in like financial planning for their business, where do you suggest they start? Well, you know, I it's sort of, I, I, is it... Uh... Mother Teresa or Arthur Ashe, he said, you know, start where you are with what you have, you know? So, you know, I think we tend to over, we get ourselves overwhelmed really quickly because when we say financial planning and we say budgeting, most people really kind of run, want to run the other way. Um, so I say, well, let's just kind of start with what we already know. We, we know what our business is about. You know, we, we make beer, we sell beer. Uh, we're craftspeople. We want to make great products. We want to have great, great interactions with our customers. We want to be good to our staff and our community. So with financial planning, I tend to just say, let's just talk about it. Let's just talk about your business. So we say words first, numbers second. So let's just talk about what's going on in your business, what's working, what's not. Where do you want to take this thing? Let's dream a little too. You know, let's get excited again about it. Because uh, we do, you know, if you talk to people that are in business for years and years and years, not making much money, it, you know, it can be a grind. So let's get back to why'd you do this? You know, what gets you excited about it? But let's talk about it. So you may come up with the, in the conversation, hey, I really want to, I want to have my beer distributed. You know, I want to work with a wholesaler. All right, let's talk about how that could work. And then you work your way from a conversation about the business and what they already know and understand and can touch and feel. And, and then you just, help them to kind of quantify it. So, you know, you already know all this stuff. You just, we just need to translate it and put it into numbers. And those numbers, we just happen to be able to organize into a financial plan, a budget. And it becomes a little less scary at that point. So when we're budgeting, you know, we've got the basic thing. We need a sales forecast. We need a gross margin plan. We need an operating expense plan. We need some other things too. It doesn't have to work in that order. So sometimes when I'm working with people, the easiest thing that they understand is what their expenses are, say, for the lease or their expenses for payroll or their expenses for insurance. And once you say, yep, I know what that is. And say, the, these are pieces of the puzzle. And you start having them just grab a piece and put it together. And before you know it, you're like, I'm halfway done with the budget. Um, and then you tackle those things that are a little tougher, like a sales forecast. Like, I don't know what I'm going to sell. You know, like, Stephen, to your point, like, I don't know what I'm doing next week. Okay, this is funny, but it's not good enough anymore. We got to know. We got we to gotta make an educated guess. And, you know, lo and behold, you probably do know because you have some historical data to draw from. Maybe you've got salespeople that can help. You've got all this technology and this the information's there. We just need to kind of settle down and start assembling it. But... I think the first step is really just to start with where they are and, you know, talk about the business and then work towards quantifying that into a plan. Yeah. And, and like you mentioned, you know, most, um, 
you know, most people really do have a plan. Like, all right, they may not know exactly what brand, right? But the idea is like, okay, let's at least get our brands into a bracket of here's what we estimate the cost to be. We know generally what our malts will be and we know we'll need cans and whatever. So you can get at least 60, 70% there. And then you're just kind of, at least you're taking away that part and sort of managing that 30% on what you may not know. Like maybe we're going to use a specialty hop here, or, you know, flavoring there or something. Right on. All right. Steven, obviously uh, this one might be a bit more geared towards you, but could you elaborate on the growing role of technology and optimizing revenue and finances within the beer industry? Obviously that's, been on an upward trend, but maybe you can tell us more. Yeah. So, I mean, adoption of technology in operations is something that I think is, we need a little bit more of, um, you know, I've kind of seen it in other industries and, and been across different things, which, so I kind of, you know, have some experience and be able to see that, but there's a lot of things that can really help. You know, we we're talking about a lot of numbers. We're talking about forecasting, uh, brand management recipes, that sort of thing, but there are ways that we can leverage technology uh, to understand that, forecast that, get a better idea of what our spend is going to be, what our costs are going to be, um, you know, through the use of technology. But then you can start getting into really f interesting things like um, it's called advanced pla planning and scheduling systems uh, and stuff like that, where we can actually do capacity planning, understand our growth patterns, what our, you know, capital expenditures are going to be over the next five years uh, and get into, you know, some really interesting detailed stuff, which that's, that's more of the fun stuff or what I consider the fun stuff. It may not be for everybody, but, um, I, I think that, you know, technology can really help a lot with costing financial, uh, one, just to keep track of it. You know, if you're trying to do this on spreadsheets, it's a little bit tougher than if you've got a centralized system, that's kind of doing some of these things for you. Um, and so, yeah, I, that, that's kind of where, I, where I would start. I mean, there's a lot of ways to get there. You know, I like I think we mentioned PPV purchase price variance, uh, also very important. You know, understanding what you're paying for stuff, what are the landed costs, how do how does that impact your brands, and then we get into things like yields, uh, being able to use that to track your costs in the system, and um, you know, also trying to use that data not just to say, oh, well, I had a bad yield, but also, okay, what are we going to do going forward to try and increase that? Because even increasing yield two percent is a ton of revenue for a brand. Um, and trying to find ways to do that. Also, it's like, all right, do I need five pounds of hops per per dry hop barrel? No, I mean, what if I drop it to four? You know, hops can be five dollars a pound. Now you're saving five dollars a barrel in your in your cost. Um, so there's stuff like that, and that's what I'm saying. There's a lot of things technology can help. You know, help businesses learn uh, to help make decisions to either you know drive cost, drive action. I think it's interesting too because most of the breweries that I work with. Um, they do, they operate on the spreadsheets and they're comfortable with them because they just, you know, it's there, I can change the number. Um, so I think they're, you know, they're half to two thirds of the way there because they're already doing the hard work of how do I do my planning, my forecasting, my ordering, how do I know? But we're just, you know, we're, we're doing it in a somewhat manual fashion. So I think it's useful to have those skills because they know what it should look like. And then when you transpose a piece of technology over it, they say, well, look at, what this system can do. It can do everything your spreadsheet can do, but you don't have to do any of the inputs. And it actually does the math correctly and it will forward forecast things, you know, in a more sophisticated way. So I think it's a good launching point. You know, there's a, there's a mindset, there's a dot, there's adoption issues, which is, ah, I don't know if I want to, if I trust that, you know, I've had bad experiences or I know this works. I know it takes longer, but I know it works. So it's a little bit of that, um, you know, security blanket thing. We don't want to necessarily let go. But I think there again, walking people from, hey, you're already doing it. This will just automate it and look at all the other things you can do and look at how much time this is going to save you. And it's and it's going to be more accurate. Um, so I, I see that a lot. And I, I do think a lot of the hesitation that for me, my personal experience with technology is just getting folks from what I know how to do to yeah, I see what you're saying, but is that really going to work? So it's sort of this bridging the gap type thing. Yeah, yeah. And it's the same, you know, it's kind of like what we talked about earlier. You know, we're talking about people that aren't, you know, they don't have IT departments. They don't have people that understand some of these things in in the way of like, you know, having a project lead to manage uh, manage some sort of transition and be able to explain it to, the, to everybody. Because again, you know, we're talking more about, I don't want to call it, say it's artistic, but it's it's not as like, standard corporate world, you know, it's meant to be a little bit more interesting, a little bit more fun. Um, 
So that's why I think part of the adoption is also like trying to like hold your hand and be like, it's okay. We're going to help you through it. And uh, we're going to, we're going to get there together. So it's, I know that's one thing that we always try to do for sure. Given both of y'all's experience in this industry, um, can you talk about what you've seen in the beer industry when a company fails to adopt these like solid financial principles and the inverse, if you want to do that as well, like how you know when one has succeeded and how you know when a company has failed to adopt like solid financial principles? Yeah, I mean, I, I think what you tend to see is a lot of stress. Like people are really like stressed out. They're uncertain. They don't really know what's going on. Um, sometimes they're embarrassed about that. Like, I don't even, I should know this. I've been in business forever. I'm embarrassed about what my numbers look like. And there's, there's really no reason for that. It's just, so when there's, there's a failure to adopt these principles or even understand them, um, there is a lot of, of sort of angst pain that, uh, that goes on. And sometimes it can be, uh, fatal, uh, cause you run out of, you run out of money. And, you know, a lot of these businesses fail cause they, they just, they didn't see it coming. You know, we're driving right off a cliff. I just didn't know. And I thought we were fine, you know, because a lot of times small business owners will run on gut and feel, you know, I look in the tap room, there's tons of people were doing great. And then all of a sudden I can't make payroll. Then I can't pay my loans. And then this happens and that happens. And before you know it, it I got to shut the doors. And it, we, we read about this every day. Um, so a failure to adopt is, can be, can really be fatal. Uh, so at, at best, it just feels really uncomfortable and uncertain. I don't know what's going on uh, to at worst, I, I have to close my doors. Now, when they do adopt them, it doesn't, it's not a magic, it's not a silver bullet, right? But it's a way to say, I have a much better handle on an understanding of what's actually going on in my business from a financial standpoint. It doesn't mean I'm automatically going to grow sales and, and cash flow, but I've got a much better chance to do so because I understand, A, what the results are currently, and B, the levers that I need to pull or try to pull in order to make these improvements. We talked about cash flow. There's cash flow drivers. There's net operating income drivers. There's not an infinite number of these things, but we need to watch two, three, four key drivers on a regular basis. Um, so that we can get to where we want to go to. So not adopting is uncertainty and, and might be failure. Adopting them gives you a lot more visibility and control uh, over the outcomes that you want to try to achieve. Yeah, from the operation side, it's it's the same. You know, I like to, it, it, if you go to a production floor where they're not following any uh, sort of processes, I just like to say it's complete chaos because there's, you know, people running around everywhere. No one knows what's going on. There's no process. Uh, and what I think typically kind of happens when they don't, you know, adopt um, a lot of these, especially now as the industry's changing, is they're they're just not making good beer and they're not, um, you know, pumping out product and ultimately kind of leading to that to that downfall. Now we're talking on the extreme side, obviously, you know, production is one of those things that you could spend your entire life like learning how to constantly grow in that and get apex certifications and things like that. But we're talking like very uh, unplanned, you know, um, small brew pubs typically, but, uh, that, that's kind of what I see is if they're not adopting, um, just kind of even basic inventory practices, they don't know what they need. They run short of materials. Now they can't make the beer they were supposed to, or they've, you know, now they're holding up tanks and the whole thing just kind of back, like pushes all the way back and, and they've shut the entire place down. Um, it's not some, some fun to watch. Um, but, you know, in terms of when they do adopt it, you almost see this like breath of re like relief, the sigh of relief of like, oh, yes, fine. <laughs> All right. We got beer moving. Sales are going. Things are going great. We're we're getting through. And then then you get to start focusing on what I call the fun things like I was talking about earlier. You've removed the need to have to just manage these tiny things and little movements within the business. And now we're like, all right, let's try to do something cool. Like, what else can we do? How do we make this even better? And you start to see that drive you know, in their like personalities kind of pick up and they're like, all right, oh, this is cool. We've, we've done good things. Now, uh, what about adding in some automation on the quality side or let's do this. And it's, it's really, it's really fun to see when, whenever like adoption happens. All right. Uh, this might be out of left field, but Carrie, you've had a lot of experience in structuring bank financing for the beer industry. Can you tell us a bit more about that, your own personal experience with it and maybe anything that you think the viewers should know? Sure. Um, you know, I think on the bank financing side is generally one of two things. One, you're trying to start up a brewery, you're trying to make kind of get money in order to do so, or you're already open and you're looking for, you know, either expansion, 
new equipment or maybe working capital lines of credit. So under either scenario, the general rule of thumb is, you know, you want to um, really kind of do your research before you actually need the money, right? Fix the roof before it starts raining. And that I advocate for just getting a basic understanding of, you know, loans, loan terms, where, how do these things work? Um, you know, from everything from SBA loans to regular, you know, commercial loans to raising, you know, capital and whatnot. So just kind of trying to educate yourself on, you know, how capitalization works. Um, what tends to get breweries in the most trouble in any businesses, frankly, is, is taking on too much debt. You know, you see this in every walk of life, you know, the mortgage crisis, we, you'll give me the money to buy that house. Therefore I must be able to pay it back. Oops. I can't pay it back. Now you're taking my house away. Um, that we see that, you know, history doesn't always repeat, but it rhymes. You know, we see some of that, like if just cause they'll give you the money doesn't mean it's a good business decision. So a lot of it is, and the, I think the most important thing is, well, number one, educate yourself on these loan terms and how they work and the structure and who's, who's actually making the decisions uh, and then building those relationships with the people that are ultimately going to be able to help you out uh, prior to actually needing it. Uh, so that's kind of best, best practices. And then it's really, okay, when I want to take on some bank financing, what, what are the economics of that? What does that actually mean? Like what I know I have to pay it back. Um, can I pay it back? You know, how to, can I afford to pay it back? So we need to do that cash flow planning to say, here are the economics of my business right now. Um, here's what it's going to look like when I take on this loan. That loan has to be paid every month, irrespective of whether I have the money in the bank or not, because the bank's not going to say, oh, it's fine. So you've got to pay it all the time. So it's really doing some, some planning um, in terms of how do these things work? And then planning in terms of if I take on X amount of debt, you know, what does that actually mean in terms of my capability to pay it back? Um, so there's a lot in that, but I think really it's, it starts with just educating yourself on, on how these loans work and what your obligations are going to be to pay them back. And I guess the last thing I would say is it's a lot of these loans come with additional financial covenants, requirements, promises that you make to the bank. So in addition to just paying it back, you're going to be required to hit certain financial covenants. Those are certain financial results. Um, so those are just generally be aware of it, understand those things are out there. The banker that you work with, believe it or not, is advocating for you. They, they want to write this business, but they want to make sure it's going to be good for everybody. So that can be your partner. Uh, so a lot of times I know there's some hesitation, like, I don't know, that, he, that person's on the other side of the table, but they really do want to work with you. But you've got to, again, you've got to bring something to the table yourself, educate yourself, understand how it works. In terms of like investing in machinery, so let's say they're using a co-packer and they're wanting to, you know, start doing their own filling. Do you feel that there's like a certain size or certain financial place they need to be? Should they, should they look for like paying cash for that initial setup or like, what do you kind of see uh, with your experience? Yeah, I think a lot of times it's first and foremost, like, all right, what are the economics of option A or B? So if, if you know, I mean, you know, a lot, the classic example is there, you know, they want to do more canning. They're using not say canning service. We know what it costs. If they were to buy their own canning line, you know, we have a pretty good idea of what that would cost, what it would cost to finance it. And so we sort of run a comparative analysis and say, you know, option A, option B, which is better. And if you can demonstrate the return on investment, good. So that's step one. And then, okay, how am I going to pay for this thing? That's step two. So it really kind of starts by understanding what's your current financial situation and, and can you take on that debt? Now, in that example, I mean, you, it sounds like you're probably paying it anyway. Um, for those that are looking to expand, you've mentioned, you know, trying to get, you know, better yields and whatnot. Sometimes that requires new and different equipment. Um, it's really just running that analysis. What's this thing going to cost? What are, what are the cash flows relative to paying it back? What are my expected outcomes from this? Uh, so I think that return on investment analysis, even if even in its most simplistic form, uh, is is generally where we start. So they can kind of see, okay, here's what the numbers uh, look like, or what we would expect for outcomes. Nice, yeah, yeah. The that return on investment analysis is always a, a big one, and it's it's a it's a big undertaking for sure uh, because we, you know, we used to do a lot of it. Um, but, you know, as breweries are kind of growing and trying to 
uh, you know, expand and, and do all that. I, you know, I worry sometimes that they're not going in that deep on that analysis to try and make sure they're doing that. Cause I think we saw that a few years ago of like a lot of investment into a certain production or a certain kind of line because it was this brand. And it's like, it really kind of does the same thing. You're paying 20% more. Are you really getting anything out of it? Um, but no, yeah, I like that. I like the idea of the analysis on the return because If it's going to be 10 years, you know, maybe, maybe we want to hold off. And it's not limited to just equipment. I mean, I mean, we like to buy things, right? We want to buy things because they're cool, they're shiny, or we like to, you know, I see it a lot on the sales side. Like we want to grow on the sales. We need more salespeople. Well, what, what outcomes are we going to get for that? I don't know. We need more salespeople. Well, is that, is there a return on investment on that? Because if we're going to drop somebody in, we're going to pay them a salary. What are we going to have for expectations? So that concept can really work in a lot of different aspects of the business. But yeah, we do tend to run sometimes on emotion, like, oh, I'd love to have that thing as opposed to, whoa, 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 is this a good business decision? You know, we can, we can temper it uh, by doing, doing some analysis there. Yeah. For both of you guys, is there any advice you want to give to uh, people in the beer industry that you think is like paramount right now at this moment? Anything you want to tell people? I mean, the biggest thing for me is don't be afraid of adoption and don't be afraid of change. You know, the industry is changing. There's, you know, it's a little, little bit dark out there right now, but I think once we get through this, this initial consolidation, I think it's going to be really good, but it also opens the doors to new ways of processing things, new ways of creating beer. And, and that, that's probably the biggest thing I would say is just don't be afraid of change. Yeah, I would, I would say uh, that I echo that for sure. I would say uh, you got to know your numbers because um, unfortunately a lot of businesses don't. And it's okay. Uh, it's it's not it's not insurmountable to figure out what what those are. So we start with cash flow, net operating income, and then you know, we kind of go from there. Most businesses that I've been involved with in the past are very focused on exclusively sales, sales, sales growth. Let's get sales, sales, sales. Nothing wrong with it, but you know the bottom line, the cash flow. That's ultimately going to create the success of your business and allow you to thrive um, into the future. So you got to know your numbers. You can start with nice, easy ones, key metrics. Everybody loves them, critical numbers, a handful of them that make sense, that are easy to look at. Uh, when we start with a full set of financials, people do tend to glaze over. It's hard. So start with some key metrics. I would recommend, you know, starting with cash flow. Look at those cash flow drivers. Look at your inventory turnover, as you mentioned, Stephen. Look at your receivables, payables, your loan payments. So just build a quick little cash flow uh, dashboard and, and get started there. Cause that's, that's ultimately in my opinion, your, your most important number in your business. Yeah. Fantastic. All right. Carrie, uh, if the listeners are interested in getting in touch with you, uh, how can they learn more about you and what you do? Sure. Two places, beerbusinessfinance.com. It's really geared towards beer wholesalers, distributors, craftbrewerryfinancialtraining.com is really geared towards breweries. So it's all financial training. You can't, uh, disentangle the operational. So I talk a lot about operational, you know, hiring compensation tactics and whatnot. Uh, but it's very much financial training for non-financial owners and managers. Fantastic. All right. Thank you so much, both of you for coming on the show. Uh, Carrie, Stephen, have a great day. Yeah. Thank you very much. It was great to meet you, Carrie. Thanks guys. Uh -huh.